welcome to this first in-person talk of the Alcuin Society since 2020. It's been four years that, uh, since we've had a, a live in-person event, and uh, what a welcome change it is. So uh, thank you all very much for coming. Uh, my name is Frank Winter. I'm a member of the executive of the Alcuin Society. So uh, just a brief uh, public service announcement. And the first thing I'm going to say is uh, please put your cell phones on mute if you haven't already done so. Uh, uh, the Alcuin Society, of, of course, is a, a very long-lived um, uh, group of uh, people who are very interested in all aspects of the book arts, and in particular the book arts in Canada. We have a, uh, a wide range of programming of uh, print publications, our journal Amphora, which comes out three times a year. Uh, we run the um, Canadian uh, Awards for uh, Book Design in Canada. We've just finished uh, the 2023 uh, judging, so uh, if you remember, expect to see the catalogs in uh, due course. We have uh, the online and the uh, in-person talks. We co-sponsored the Ways Goose every couple of years, and uh, many other events as well. If you, are, uh, you can look at our webpage, uh, alcoholsociety.com, for um, news and events. And if you uh, do join, um, there is a very active email list to um, letting you know what's going on. Anyway, enough about the Alcuin Society uh, tonight's speaker, uh, Michael Klepner, known to many of you in uh, many different uh, um, ways, and uh, I'm proud to say that uh, I have an almost complete collection of Klepneriana <laughs> <laughs> books and uh, watercolors and uh, things as well. Anyway, I'd like to invite uh, Lynn Copeland to come up tonight and introduce tonight's speaker. I'm well, pleased to have me this opportunity to introduce Michael Kleckner as tonight's speaker. Um, most of us know Michael as an author and artist with such books as Vanishing Vancouver, Vanishing British Columbia, Toshika, and at the back, get one, Surviving Vancouver, until that is The Rooming House, which, though fictional, reveal this hippie era past. And it is from that past that Michael's talks today stems, because during that time, he learned the skills of newspaper layout and offset printing, and honed his skills as an artist. I look forward to your talk, Michael, Offset Layout and Pre-Press of Vanished Craft. Thank you very much. And, uh, and, and Lynn, besides being a really good friend, introduced me to Ken Ken Puzzles, which is how I fill up the end of my evening before, before going to sleep. Lynn, Lynn, former director of Simon Fraser University Library System, has a master's degree in mathematics. I have a bachelor's degree in mathematics. Oh. It just shows that whatever you do doesn't have any, whatever you start doing has nothing to do with what you're going to do. Next. <laughs> So tonight, um, uh, I've got to tell you where this rather weird topic comes from. And, and it comes from a conversation that I had in the Billy Bishop Legion with my old friend, my old 38-year-old friend, Kellen Higgins, who's in the back corner there. And Kellen is the guy who actually got the tech to work tonight. So don't go anywhere without a 38-year-old. <laughs> the first thing that you have to say. But uh, Kellen, uh, when he was a student at UBC, he got involved in doing the newspaper design for the UBC newspaper. And, and he was talking about this, and, and of course, in his day, it was all desktop. It was all computerized. And I got talking about how when I got started, and there were terms that I was using that he had never heard of before. PMTs, all these sorts of things that we used to, um, that we used, to use. And so we, we talked back and forth for some time until everybody else had left the table. They were too bored. And, uh, and then I decided when, um, when I was offered this opportunity to speak to the Alton Society that I would begin with this because I realized that everything that we did, that, um, that I did, that Ken Pattern did, 
And that a lot of you did back in the in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and that. It's just a completely disappeared craft. It's been complete. It, it's been superseded by different technologies. And so I thought, well, I'll go and see what I can find out about this. What I can find online. What is what is there that explains how we used to do newspapers and books? And so um, uh, first, an acknowledgement. Um, this is a site prepressure.com, which is huge fun. To, uh, to scroll through for all these old images and a little bit of technical information about um, everything that happened sort of pre-press uh, back in the day. Um, so once upon a time and continuing on as a craft and a wonderful way of, of producing books, there was letterpress printing and hand setting type. And I look at this and you, you'd be working with a mirror image of the type and you would be pulling individual letters and turning. And I think of what that would have done for the brain plasticity of the people who were doing this. Um, <clears throat> when, you, when you look at the old photographs, the term labor intensive comes to mind. Uh, it's just these extraordinary uh, large rooms of people, but I guess men would be more accurate. Just doing this hour after hour after hour, accurately setting type for newspapers, for books, in a technology that goes right back to Gutenberg in, what is it, 1460, more or less, when, uh, when that happened? Uh, when uh, the idea of movable type came along. They're working with the California job case. And and, and I say, for me, Point Grey School, 1963. So Point Grey School, Westside Vancouver School, um, in addition to the academic stuff, boys did woodwork, metalwork, and printing. And I was talking with Glenn Woodsworth about this the other, the other night. And he said, oh yeah, I did that course too, a few years before you. And, and he remembered the name of the teacher who was this, this misnamed man, Mr. Weaver. Should have been in a different craft uh, pretty altogether. <laughs> but the boys did printing and the girls did, of course, home economics and typing, and there was that, there was that real gender split at that time. But um, I found this image of a California job case, and, and you see the ligatures up there the FFI, the FL, the FF, the FI, and the FFL in their, in their tiny little compartments. And so you would just stand there by the hour with your, your stick on your hand and your manuscript there, and you would be setting letters one at a time. Um, and then when the, when the lines were complete, they would go into forms, and the guy on the, uh, on the left-hand side there is hammering the, the forms together and tightening everything up, getting it ready for the press. Um, this is actually an Australian, Australian image, so this was a, a world really a world technology of newspapers and, and books. Now the technology did advance from there into the linotype machine. So the linotype <coughs> machine set a linotype, a line of type. And by, as the operator hit the keys on the keyboard, and this is, I, I, I don't know this, I only know this by reading about it, and some of you may actually have operated some of these things. But as you hit a key, a little sort of hollow matrix fell down into position. And at the end of the line, hot metal was poured in, which cast the line of type. Mm -hmm. And then that was somehow cast into a larger form. And, and, the, and so a manuscript or, or a newspaper article or a page would be developed from that. And so that term hot type composition came. And, or hot metal composition. And then when, it went, when the whole industry began to move into offset printing, the term came up cold type composition. And so that was what kept hearing this cold type composition. And, and so this is sort of where, where I come in and, and, and Ken Pattern comes in, and probably some of the other, other of you in, in the room, in the 1960s and the 1970s. I'm sorry if that's kind of hard to read at the bottom there. 
the um, all of the alternative newspapers that you were volunteering for, working for, like the Georgia Strait, the neighborhood newspapers, they were all run on offset presses at these companies like College Printers, which is now firmly in the heart, well, the, the, the location at uh, 12th and Maple, firmly in the heart of Congo land. Uh, at that time, this was an industrial part of Vancouver. And um, I remember going into College Printers 1973, uh, 1974, and they still had one line of pet machine with one operator and I guess one press to run it because they were still doing the racing form. And as long as there was this one guy there who was doing the racing form and that was his job, then they kept on doing the line of pet. And I had, never having paid attention to horse racing, I had no idea what happened to it after that. But for me, um, coming out of university with my math degree and my minor in fine arts and having no idea what I was going to do, I stumbled into this world of alternate newspapers, of a little bit of writing for the Georgia Strait, and then forming in with people, and we started putting out these little newspapers in, um, in the neighborhood. And, and so it was just a complete mystery to me what was going on, but you learn pretty quickly because the technology was not that advanced. And then I discovered with my, at that time, um, I guess you could say undeveloped artistic ability, that if I did a drawing in black ink on white paper, I could paste it onto a layout sheet and 5,000 copies would come in. And I thought, this is absolutely heaven. This, this just seems to be the most wonderful thing in the world. And so um, a group of us, um, this was in, in, in Kitsilano, but we, if I, if I can use the word professionalized very, very loosely, we, um, we got grants, in some cases in neighborhoods, and there were neighborhood papers, the Mount Pleasant Mouthpiece, the Linear Magpie, and Marpole. There were a number of these that were done. And you would get, you would get onto uh, an Opportunities for Youth or a local initiatives program grant, and that would do for six months, and then the paper would either die or you would put it together. But this is um, around Kitsilano, um, little newspaper. Um, one of the other volunteers on it was Christine, who is sitting right there, and, and, um, and we've been together for 46 years, so you meet the nicest people <laughs> um, And there's no way that this is art, or, or, or good quality typography, or anything like that, but it's just kind of affordable personal expression, I guess is the way that, that, uh, the, the best to describe it. And so, a typical page out of that, uh, an article on <coughs> saving the university endowment lands, which the provincial government wanted to turn into housing in 1973-1974. Uh, in and uh, you see the ads at the bottom, we the volunteers would divide up the commercial areas of Kitsilano amongst us, go down the street, try to sell ads, and when we sold two or three hundred dollars worth of ads, which was the value of the printing plate, we would stop put the ads in and fill the rest of the paper and go from there. So, so it was just that how, I guess, affordable and accessible this was. And looking back on it, the fact that none of us had any money and we were still able to, I guess, express ourselves without needing an iPhone 15 or, 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 uh, or and a data plan and all these things that people need now. And believe me, it's very accessible now. So I went looking online to see if I could find photographs of the kind of um, tech, if I can use the word loosely, um, that we use to put out these little newspapers. Um, Non-reproducing blue pencil, well anything that you did on the layout on this light blue wouldn't print. So, And you'll see there, there's a typeset galley, so the body copy of a newspaper article, or it could be of a book page, um, pages of letter set, and a wax of it. That was super expensive. That must have been probably five or ten dollars or something. And you would plug that in and put wax in it, and that was your how you made the galleys adhere to the to the layout sheet that you were, you were working on. I've got a light table there, but you didn't actually need a light table. I think that uh, that was probably something that, that we built a little bit later. Now, Letraset, um, is there anybody in the room who has 
never use the medical site. <laughs> a couple of people, a couple of people who put it up, and Gina said that she had, and she had some sheets of lactose. I brought you a sheet. <laughs> and uh, so you would, you would buy in the font that you wanted, in the in the size that you wanted, and then rub on the sheet, and the the letter would transfer onto the paper. So this this was just really quite a magic. And we all ended up with these big collections of, of, um, of uh, particular fonts. And you would always run out of the E's, and so you would put a C in, and then you would try to draw, you would try to draw the bar across the bottom. You know, anything that you could do to avoid going in buying the other sheet of paper. The the measurements were were very much of the time. So this is my old. Uh, my old metal ruler that I bought somewhere around 1973, 1974. On the right hand side, points. So points are the height of type. You also measure the leading, the space between lines with that. One seventy-second of an inch is a point. And on the left hand side, those are pipettes, although it says six and twelve point, but twelve points is a pipette, so a sixth of an inch. And you measured the width of columns in pipe. So you would have, you know, however, not, not a three inch wide one, but you would have an 18 pipe column. The, um, the other side of the ruler had inches on it, which was useful from time to time. It also had agate lines. That's a, a term that was used for, um, for selling advertising in the daily newspapers. One fourteenth of a column inch was an agate line, and that was the pricing for ad selling in, in the dailies. Uh, so how did you, how did you, how did one set type at that time? Well, you could do anything, and, and you know think of um, think of mimeograph machines uh, before that of people, and when electric typewriters came in, they would they would make this real hard little character thing, and so you would mimeograph out your manifesto and read for people. But uh, with with offset printing, really, you'd be working with um, You'd be trying to get a really clean kind of typeset image. And um, when I moved to San Francisco in 1974 to be a starving artist, I, um, I got a job uh, at the Bay Guardian newspaper as a typesetter on an IBM composer. So you recognize that it's like the old IBM selective typewriters with the little, the little uh, type ball on the top that you could lift off and you could replace with a different font. The, um, the composer, um, of course, it had a carbon ribbon because you needed that really clean image of it. But as I remember, um, and this is 50 years ago, but as I remember, it, you would type in a line and you couldn't, you know, if you hit a key wrong, you couldn't back up over it. But you would type in a line and when you got to the end of the line, the machine would retype it and justify it. So. So justified type means not ragged right. So the, the right hand side is lined up as the left hand side is lined up. And, um, and it seems to me also that, that it would print it out with proportional spacing because old fashioned typewriters, of course, the I would take up the same amount of room as the M. And so it was very, very inefficient in terms of the use of space. So this was this was okay, but it was not it was not a particularly uh, particularly good uh, piece of technology. But just about that time, a company called CompuGraphic came out with what were called photomechanical typesetters. And what they did was, for the first time, you had just that little bit of a buffer memory so that if you made a mistake when you were typing, you could back up, correct that. And it was only when you got to the end of the typeset line and it went over that the line would print. And it, the way that, and it, this, and I don't know if, it, if you can read any of that, it says that the original had two 96 character typefaces in sizes from 5 to 12 points. And then it had a manual lens change in it, so that it was a kind of a lens turret and you could use. So you, all of a sudden you've got a kind of a flexibility in, in doing type for newspapers or for books that you never had before. Um, the font um, was actually on a strip of film, 
and there was this rotating drum, and as a letter went by, the letter that was required to be recorded went by, there's a little spit of light that came out and photographed that letter onto a piece of, uh, of photographic paper. And then the photographic paper moved into the little cassette on the side. And when you got to the end of when when you got to the end of what you were doing, you would develop that, and then you had this beautifully typeset, justified. So all of a sudden, we, we seemed it just seemed this was almost effortless to do the um, uh, to do the uh, to do the typesetting that we needed. Talked about letter set, we've talked or display type, I guess. We've talked about typesetting galleys. How do you do graphics and images back in that pre-digital age? Well, you go into a shop, could be a printer, could be just a straight graphic shop, and there would be a big graphics camera like this. And some of these things were just monsters. The the bed on them would was about 20 feet long. And the whole idea was, of course, that you you would be adjusting the lens and you'd be adjusting the, the, the subject of it to get the proportion of reduction that you wanted in order to, to get an image down to the size. And in fact, what they looked like was like this, so that that part on the left-hand side was inside the darkroom. And the darkroom could have a red light on because you were dealing with orthochromatic film. You were dealing with film that, that, um, um, that was not um, what did you say? It wasn't like panchromatic film, so red light didn't expose it. So you could work your way under, under the light. So this would be like in a big shop, but in the um, in the small shop that that I worked at um, at at, uh, at BCIT in the late seventies, we had a vertical graphic camera. So I drew a little vertical graphic camera there. You see the original art and photo there, and what what we're doing here is. Um, we want to reduce the image of the flower down to the size that we can put it in the layout. So, you know, pretty, pretty straightforward graphics. So. And so what we used for that in any low resolution type of thing was something called a PMT, a photomechanical transfer. And I see Glenn nodding his, nodding his head and a couple of other people nodding heads on that. It was a, a paper negative that you put on the camera and you exposed it. And then you took a positive sheet out of another, uh, and this is all taking place in the dark room, of course, a positive sheet out. And you fed the two of them together through this bath of an activator and a stabilizer, peeled them apart. Hey, presto, you had this beautiful, crisp drawing, image, graphic, whatever it was. And I'm talking about images just done with lines. I'm not talking about photographs at this stage. But you'll see there's one up in the right up in the top on the left, a half-tone screen. We'll talk about doing half-tones. But let's say you've got your little image out and you would take that in your type and you would paste it up on a sheet that you got from your, from your printing company. It would have the columns on it all in that pale blue line and, that, and you, would, you would paste this all up and, and it would be ready actually to go to press. I put a little square there, a little red square called Ruby Lift. Ruby Lift you pasted into the layout if you wanted to do high resolution images. So for, for books or for magazines, anything like that. And then most people know, I think, what a half tone is. And they know why you need to do half tones for printing. The reason you need to do half tones for printing is because a printing press will only print black ink. It won't print black in a hundred shades of gray. It'll just print black. So to give the illusion of tone, the only way of doing it, or the way that was invented for doing it in the 19th century, was called the half tone. You break an image up into dots of different sizes. And you can see in this very, very blown up one, you can see dots that are, go down to about 10% of the coverage going up to probably 80 or 90 percent and it gives that tone of range and so that's what you're doing if you ever wanted to reproduce a photograph or uh, let's say a wash drawing and of course it would be the same thing in color and I'll mention that in a minute or two but much more complicated. Um, 
the same, it was the same sort of thing if you were doing artwork, and you were doing artwork for publication. And, but bende dots was the old term for it, but um, zipatone became the commercial name, and people would refer to it somewhat disparagingly as mechanical color or comic book. And it entered into the fine art world with Roy Lichtenstein's pop art uh, paintings in, in, the, uh, in the 1960s. But off we would go down to um, uh, Benson's, um, uh, Benson's Silk Screen Supplies, I think it was called Benson's on Richard Street, which now have condos and nightclubs and all the rest of it. And we would buy sheets of Zipatron when we were down there um, also buying the, uh, the Lepicent. The real master of that locally uh, of, in, in publications was Lynn Norris. And Norris used a brush and ink, not, not a pen and ink. You would think that he used a pen and ink just because of the, the fine quality of what he was doing. But when he wanted to add a tone into an image, he would take a sheet of zipatone of the right shading that he wanted and the right resolution that he wanted. And this was a sort of self-adhesive thing. He would put that down over it again, smooth it out, get out his exacto knife, and then he would cut out everything that he wanted to stay white. So you see in this drawing there, the faces, the legs, um, and also incredibly skillfully the raindrops and the reflections in the color. So that's all. That's all cut out of a sheet of zipatone in order that it doesn't print. And you, it gives that illusion in, in what has to be the crudest medium, uh, the daily newspaper. He gives this wonderful illusion of rain and so on. He was the real master of that. Um, a little bit later on, this, this cartoon is 19, uh, 1964, I think it says on the bottom. A little bit later on in the Georgia Strait, um, uh, Rand Holmes was re very wonderful at, at also using Zipatone in some of the drawings that he was doing. But never with, in my recollection of Rand Holmes, never with quite the subtlety that Lynn Morris used in this. Of course, the other way of um, the other way of, of putting tones in of, of artists putting tones in was just with hatching the crosshatch. If you wanted to do sort of shading and drawing, and so this was the sort of thing that I was doing in the late nineteen seventies for um, for the Bank of the Sun and, and for the province. In, in a lot of ways, was was easier and quicker than, than uh, messing around with zipatone. So, you prepare the layout for printing, and um, we're back with our great big camera there. You put the film on. You notice a little vacuum hose going up to the uh, to that um, um, shelf, I guess you would call it, that, that would hold the the negative on there, the film. And you take the picture, and so just at the top, what a layout would look like with the PMTs pasted in, if you're following me. Uh, and if you're doing a higher resolution thing, like a book or a magazine, you would, uh, you would put ruby lip, uh, little squares in it. And then you would develop that negative in the tray on the bottom left. And then once the negative was dry, you would Put it in a vacuum frame against a printing plate and burn the plate, as it was called, with a carbon arc lamp. And that would give you your, your finished printing plate. The, uh, and so this is, this is where the lithography thing comes in. That the printing plate runs through a water bath. And the water adheres to all of, all of the parts of the plate that haven't been exposed to light. And so they are hydrophilic, those unexposed parts. And then you run it through an ink bath, and that puts ink just on the parts that you want to print. And you bounce it off that, that middle cylinder there, and then it comes off the offset printing one, and all of a sudden you're printing. And so it's a, it's a kind of an industrial version of the lithography that, that is the fine art printing process that goes back for, for so many years. I um, 
I grabbed uh, just the other day an image of a very small printing press, an eighty big three sixty. A lot of shops have these, and maybe you can see up at the top there that there's um, there's the, the ink fountain, and then there's this aquamatic fountain, and so it's that ink and water, it's that combination there that allows you to print like that, and allowed all of that, all of those elements of layout of um, of working with something that you can read as opposed to the mirror image of something. And then the, the relatively simple process, inexpensive process that you went to to, um, to create the printing plate. And then off it would come. So I haven't mentioned color because color just was complex and expensive. It was effectively the same process. But if um, you, know, you look back, uh, 50 years or so, and you look at how many color books were being done, or the number of books. You remember, with those of you who have been in the, in, the, in the printing business or the publishing business, the expression four over one, you would, you would print a book four over one, so you four color on one side of the sheet, one color on the other side of the sheet. It was just money. The, uh, the color separations of paintings, of, of, of color photographs, and that was very, very expensive. And so it was just, it was just quite difficult to, uh, to do that. And this little, this little drawing shows the way that you would get different tones out of using the four basic colors, the cyan, the magenta, the yellow, and then K, or C-N-Y-K, that's the key, key block color always in, in printing too, so that's the black ink. But early in the 1980s, the move began away from what we've been talking into the digital age. And uh, uh, I found this, this image online of, of an Osborne. I bought an Osborne computer in 1983 because I was doing a big manuscript for um, a book called Vancouver the Way It Was. And I had this dream that I could have this wonderful manuscript and that somehow or another it could come off and drive a typesetter and the whole thing wouldn't have to be re-keyboarded and then Reproofed and all the little line corrections and everything put in, and uh, and so so this was this was the first thing that I got and I was actually successful. I I found somebody who was able to um, transmit directly from this little computer with the cable into a typesetting machine, so we were able to typeset the whole book. But uh, you know this this idea that it was that it was like a laptop the way we think about it now it was it was just this real luck it was like uh, you know something that you could barely get into the overhead locker on an airplane but it just seemed magical um, 1984 is the year though because the apple macintosh comes out and it's an available uh, computer with a graphic interface so you're able with a mouse and, and able to kind of typeset on the layout on the screen and, and begin to add graphics into it. So just sort of like everything that we dreamed of doing, like that we had been doing with, with paper and exacto maps and everything, we, it, it became possible. If you look at the, um, it says it, it's, um, uh, memory is limited to 128K. So, um, you know, your typical, uh, the typical image that you would even put onto a website now is about 500k. So it's just the, this was very, 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 very small, very, very slow, but it was revolutionary when it came out. A little statement there, ahead of its time, and will have a profound effect on the graphic arts market. Boy, um, very, very truthful words. Following year, PageMaker comes out as the first really um, I guess you would say really good program for doing layouts on the computer screen. And um, it was very rapidly nicknamed RageMaker because it had this tendency to collapse right in the middle, to crash right in the middle of, um, of, uh, of something that you were doing. You would put two hours, three hours into something and you would just look at it the wrong way and pop down the road. And, um, but it was still, you know, everything was a step of improvement. Um, and the technology advanced really quickly after that. A lot of people have heard of Quark. I think some people even still use Quark. And, uh, 
I see a couple of heads nodding there. And this is coming as, as Adobe, as the Adobe company seems to gradually be consolidating this control over the graphic arts market. And so with Photoshop, um, and I believe that they bought Quark and it all came together into what is today, I think, the kind of standard in the industry is InDesign, is the, is the, uh, the program that everybody uses. And uh, so this is, this is what my computer screen looks like at home when I'm working on a book. I'm working on the, the book that, um, that, that Lynn just read, that, that has just come out. Um, I'm able to manipulate images, shrink them, move them, all that, just with the mouse on the screen. These are images that have been scanned into the computer's memory. They could be colored, they could be black and white. You can just do all of these sorts of things. And then in my case, I actually write the text there around the layout that, that I created. And of course, if I were doing somebody else's book, I wouldn't have that option. I would have a long chunk of text and there would be some illustrations. I would try to fit everything in and get, you know, get the illustration on the same page as the reference to it in, in, the, uh, in the book. But um, so the, you know, the long days effectively spent um, are now in front of a computer screen rather than bent over a layout table. Um, one of the things that I learned, I sort of picked up along the way and I kind of believed in, was this idea of trying to keep the reproduced image as close as possible to the size of the original. And I'm sure all of you own art books, um, books of, of oil paintings and you know, maybe you've never seen original oil or paintings, or but you see it like this, and then you go into, you see the original in the art museum, and you're overwhelmed by the size, and also the change of scale, and how that change of scale has affected it. And um, one of the advantages for me of, of, of working with watercolor is that I'm able to work quite small. It's not a medium that lends itself to, to big stuff anyway, partly because of the glass that would fall off the wall from trying to kill somebody. But, um, but working at a fairly, fairly small um, scale, <coughs> and then with the reduction of it, you get some element of authenticity to it. And it's always one of the things for me of looking at books with oil paintings in them, and then seeing the original oil painting, that no matter how good the reproduction is, you lose that sense of the surface, you lose you know, the impasto, all of that. So to me, uh, to me, watercolor has always been a, a great uh, uh, medium for reproduction like this. Uh, mass production. So this is not this is not making prints in the sense of what we we all talk about in the Alpine Society is effectively the fine art print. This is mass production. This is taking something and just you know reducing it down. I mean, we think about um, um, the the book that uh, the, the, the book that has just come out, a twenty five dollar book representing a couple of years of work for me, um, twenty five dollars is five dollars less than a one day admission into the Vancouver Art Gallery. So it's a sort of a democratizing in a way of, 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 of images. And one of the things I really like about um, I like about this kind of reproduction is how you can pick up things like, for example, paper texture, the watermark, you know, the aquarelle arch, uh, the, the, the brand name of the, of the watercolor paper, and that you can reproduce that quite authentically, even almost the shadows that it has with, uh, with, the, uh, with the current technology. But this brings me back to a book of more than 25 years ago that I did with, with Rainco's books. And, and, um, and uh, signed with them, I guess, in, in 1995 or 1996. And they had a very talented designer named Dean Allen. Did anybody in the room remember, remember Dean Allen? Oh, good. Yeah, yeah Dean. Uh, uh, and he was only about 30, I think, at that time. Just, just really bright, really terrific designer. And um, he. Um, he moved a few years after this. He moved to France and then kind of lost touch with him. But he died. Uh, he, he died a few years, I think, 
five, six years ago. He's only a little bit over 50, and I gathered that the circumstances were all rather tragic. On it. But, but Dean was a very, very talented designer, and so he did this first book that I did for, that I did for Raincoat. And, uh, and I, you can see it won the Alton Book Prize. Dean loved his white space. He, uh, he really had a stylish way of dealing with the, the white space. And so he'd taken these uh, little sort of vignette watercolors that I had done. That were, I guess the originals were probably about the size of my hand. And reduced them way down in there. And he referred to them as the little jewels in the layout. And, uh, and I, I admit that they looked really fine. They did look, uh, they did look very good. But part of the problem with that level of reduction from the original, and then his need to have them vignetted, so therefore there would be no printing dots sort of muddying on the outside of the image, was that they had to be overexposed. And so it lost a lot of what I really wanted to see in the image in return for getting a really terrific design. The, um, the year after that, with the, with the second book that I did, that, that, um, that Dean designed, um, I had the original smaller, and they more fit the size of the, of the book that we were doing. And it was a much more successful thing. And then also the scanning technology had improved just that much in that year that I was able to get something that really looked like that, that I was very pleased with. And, uh, you know, the generous margins and all the rest of it, it just, it was a, it was a very, very fine book. And, um, but what I decided when I started working on, on Surviving Vancouver was that I wanted to um, reproduce some of those images again. And, um, and reproduce them more, much closer to the original size of it. And also, I mean, partly because I, I just wanted to get them the way I wanted to see them. But I also wanted them to be, um, uh, they, some of them are just such period pieces. I mean, there are people at phone booths. I, I don't think there's a phone booth in Vancouver. <laughs> uh, there are people reading newspapers in cafes. Well, you do occasionally see that sort of thing. And, uh, and then, you know, adding some, some new sort of information in there. But all I had to work from were Fuji chrome slides that I had taken with a, with a good camera. In, uh, in 1996, and then everything was sold after that. All of the uh, all of the originals were sold. So I scanned the um, I scanned the originals in, and so this is the sort of thing that you end up doing um, in order to set stuff up for reproduction. Now, that little that little circle there is a digital paintbrush. This is on my computer screen, and I am taking out all of those background dots around so that I can get the image to just print on the white paper. You can imagine how much fun that was, just <laughs> sitting there and just doing that, getting every damn dot of the every little piece. But anyway, you know, you do one a day or something like that. And, uh, and those of you who have got better quality tech than I do will recognize this as being about a 12-year-old Little, you can see down on the bottom there, a 12 year old uh, tablet. So I'm, I'm looking up the screen, but my hand is moving down here. And that's another skill, I guess, that has, has gone the way of the dodo because most people now are working directly on screens and they're working, uh, they're, they're working on um, like iPad professional tablets. But the end result is, is um, you know, I think worked out really well. Um, uh, Getting these images in and then adding some new ones, the ones on the right hand side are, are more, um, more contemporary little people than this. And, uh, and so moving, moving on from there, um, I just want to talk briefly about, about printmaking because I'm not a printmaker. There are people in this room who, uh, uh, actually, I'm not seeing Gary soon. I don't know that Gary was able to be here tonight. And Ken, uh, Ken Pattern, of course, is. A, is a, Superb printmaker, um, but I was—I never really got into doing that. I was more um, interested in doing the artwork for it. Uh, and the one book that I did that got me going on on printmaking was a sequel to the uh, to the Pulitzer Prize 
done to hit a lower price point, as you would probably see in the publishing industry, um, a little book called Wiseacres. And I took some of the black and white uh, drawings out of it and did them as woodcuts. And I was never particularly happy with them. I didn't think that they had any sort of subtlety to them at all. But um, I was aware, um, and this was because of the amount of time spent in Australia. In Australia, there is a, quite a, uh, a large number of artists who have done black and white woodcuts and then hand colored them, usually with watercolor or with wash. And uh, particularly if you go into art galleries in South Wales or the National Gallery in, uh, um, in, in Canberra, you'll see and a lot of it was done by, by women artists in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and Margaret Preston probably being the, the best of them, but this is just an example of uh, that kind of artwork. But you know, I began to look at this thing and say, how could I take that kind of woodcut effect and and color it with not having a tremendous amount of, of particular skill and I did this with a few uh, black and white woodcuts and just colored them up with a little bit of watercolor really like the effect on it but I don't know where it, it's sort of neither chocolate cheese it doesn't really sit in, in, in one genre or another um, and then going off on a completely separate tangent from that how many of you are aware of William Rice? A few hands, a few hands are going up. Um, a California artist. Uh, part of the arts and crafts movement in the Bay Area in the in 1920s through the 1940s, and he did color wood block prints. And I throw this in just entirely out of this this is this is a brief pause in in, in me talking about myself. He bought a calendar of, um, of his block prints, and I, I thought they were just superb. Um, so these are color wood block prints, and, and they don't look like reduction prints. They look like they are multiple block and, and working through. Maybe some of you would have a better idea of that, but there's another example of them there. And this is style, I think, and you know, they really have a, have a lot of impact. These are limited edition prints, of course. This is not like my mass-produced offset print. I think what I really like to do, though, is, is I'm like that 18th and 19th century Japanese guys who wanted to do a drawing and then hand it off to somebody to do the printing of it. And so, um, so you know, I, 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 love the, I love the black ink. I, believe me, this is the ultimate antidote to doing watercolor. You have to put all the softness on it. And, um, and working on things like this and then putting some of them in books, but I've never managed to get the um, ambition together to do them as, uh, as woodblock prints. Again. But this style took me into illustrating the, the fourth of my uh, sort of graphic novels, The Rooming House, in a real chiaroscuro, a real clear obscure black and white. And, uh, and it um, was an interesting exercise. I wouldn't have wanted to be the pressman running this thing with all that black ink and not wanting it to go right through the back of the sheets. But um, it gave, uh, gave the opportunity for a lot of flexibility and a lot of real tonal work where um, you know, you've got effectively shadows creating space, which I think is the, about the best thing that you can do with that. And it got, uh, you know, it got a lot of publicity of old ex hippies and so on who, who bought it into, into uh, well into a second printing. So I was very pleased with that. The, uh, the cover of it was black ink, uh, and uh, just black ink, but computer color, so that it would have that pop that things need to survive on bookstore shelves these days. As you can see, I'm really quite commercial. <laughs> But I did, um, I did just carry on uh, with a little bit and, and coloring some of the black and white ink drawings that I had done with a bit of watercolor, just sort of looking for the effect, looking, wondering how it would work out. And this was around the time, I guess, that uh, we bought the William Rice calendar. So beginning to look at it at a different way of doing these things. And then um, 
out of the blue got an offer to illustrate uh, a graphic novel on the Jewish labor resistance in the Russian Empire in the early 20th century. And the, the offer to do this was from a, from a Toronto publisher came um, just two months after Russia had invaded the Ukraine. So it just seemed to have just everything in terms of a contemporary uh, kind of subject um, because the, uh, the Jewish people living in the Russian Empire, of course, they're within the pale of settlement. They are um, oppressed by Cossacks. They are, um, um, they are murdered, they are killed, their villages are burned with beauty. And so this just seemed like, well, you know, here we are 120 years later and it's all happening all over again. And uh, the, other, the other thing that was very interesting was that it gave me the opportunity, it's not often you get the opportunity to do a graphic novel in color. They're just too expensive to do or, or to market. But, but this one, uh, this one was able to uh, was able to do it in color, and sort of play with kind of color palettes to 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 try to make color speak to people's economic conditions as well as to um, as you know as well as just for the aesthetics of putting something like that together. And um, and of course because it's set in the uh, in the Russian Empire, you get to use a lot of white space, lots of snow. All the way. A, uh, so that was a that was a, a very interesting project, and um, in the course of it, in the manuscript, the the the, the Bundists and these are Yiddish-speaking Jewish socialists in Poland, Ukraine, Lithuania, um, uh, Western Russia, that they have these secret printing presses set. Uh, and, and where, they're, where they're printing their literature, and then it gets discovered, so I got to draw somebody smashing the printing press. So that was something that works to do. Just to wrap up uh, here, the, uh, this new book has given me an opportunity. I've gone back to mixing image types with type itself in, in layouts. And, just enjoying that richness of a layout that you can get where you're doing maybe a watercolor with a, 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 an ancient photograph across the same fold. Um, a watercolor, something of an ink drawing, a colored ink drawing, and a, and a photograph, and another, and another set. But just trying to do things because I, I think, I, mean, I don't know about you, but I think that whether we have wanted it to happen or not, that the being around computer screens, being around this constant richness changing of images and spaces changed our perception. As well, the, the transmitted light coming through a screen as opposed to the reflected light off a book, I think has affected the way that we see color. I think we, we want to see color more richly now than we used to. And so, um, you know, can mix things up and, and, uh, and but then also go back to something that you know wouldn't have been out of place in an earlier book of mine. Just um, the, the the cover image of it. I this was a watercolor I did in, in two thousand in the West End of um, a little grocery store that looked like it was on its last legs, and um, and it was November and it was raining and it was a depressing day and I put this image in a show and it didn't sell because it was too depressing. <laughs> you know, probably people said, I'm not going to look at it every day. <laughs> and, and so when I, I thought of the title Surviving Vancouver and the idea of putting this into a book, I thought this is a perfect image for us because we, we survived the Vancouver of the winter. But then there's the other thing going on in there that when I painted this, I was sure that that little grocery store was going to disappear. And that a great big tall building like the um, Landmark Hotel on Robson Street in the background would, uh, would be there for a long time because it, after all, was only 25 years old in 2000. So you go back down there today and you look at the same scene the little grocery store has been fixed up and it's now the Cardulo Cafe with chairs outside and it's a neighborhood pub. 
people coming, meeting their friends there, and so on. The Landmark Hotel has been torn down. <laughs> a climate crime, if there ever was one. And replaced by two luxury condo towers. So, funny the way sometimes you do something and you think you're seeing something, that, and then you come back to it and you're seeing something else. On it. So, that's been really, I guess, the saga of everything that uh, everything that I've learned. And I thank you. And I just want to plug a little art show and a book launch. I mean, we're sort of having a book launch here today. But art show and uh, and a book launch at the Petty Jones Gallery, Granville Street, just, um, just almost next door, effectively immediately to the north of Heffel at 7th and Granville. And uh, Saturday, April 6th, from 1 to 4.30. So uh, come along if you can. I'd love to, love to see you. And I want to thank uh, you all for coming out. And thank uh, thank Alvin for inviting me to speak again. It's just, it's just been great. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, lovely, really interesting talk. Um, Lots of memories. Uh, I hadn't heard Mr. Weaver's name for a long, long time. Oh, so you did we'll, uh, <laughs> okay. Point grade print shop, I think, uh, Glenn. And, uh, <laughs> three people as either a conspiracy or a club will we'll have to work it out. <laughs> the uh, plasticity, uh, so many things resonate with me. I'll, I'll just uh, I'll lose my position here for a second. Uh, there, there's an old story about plasticity of composite working with type. And again, uh, Oxford University Press, of course, has a huge ancient scripts and typography shop. And uh, there's an anecdote of a, a compositor coming up to an editor and saying, Professor X has made this mistake in Aramaic. And I said, well, what do you know about Aramaic? And Professor X says, uh, he said, my hands have never made that movie. <laughs> it must be a mistake. Anyway, uh, um, and the last. Uh, so, questions, comments? Uh, interesting. So, I started uh, working at the UBC in 2006 or seven, and we just switched over to InDesign. And I was I had no idea what a, like, I, until today, I didn't know what a, a point was, like, and a pika. Um, it was just like, oh, there's some weird numbers in there. Uh, I'll just go with it. Uh, we'll just do it. It's just about this size. So it's interesting to, I just kind of learned by fire <laughs> as opposed to it. And also the other thing that is that the UBC was doing the, the paste up until 2003, 2002, which seems quite late um, for, and they were shipping them down to, uh, we were using call for as well up until even I was there in 2009. So yeah. it's interesting. Yeah. So glad it lasted that long. The last book that I did that was that was uh, typeset and paste up at home was was the biggest book I ever did. The Toronto way it was three hundred and twenty pages, and and um, the, the room that I had to work in, I had I had a tight galley of going from ceiling to floor all the way around the room. Oh. It's just it's just the most incredible kind of logistical thing to keep to keep it together, um, and. Uh, I think the manuscript for that that was on those little were they five inch floppy disks and I think it was, I think it was on twenty seven floppy disks to do the manuscript for that book. So um, you know, and now it, you know now doing this this whole surviving Vancouver thing has taken up like this much of the hard drive on the iMac. So what a, what a different world. Thanks, Kelly. I have one more question. Do you think anything around the, like the paste up look? Is there a sp specific look that you can't reproduce in uh, using computers with the paste up print look? Because I'm wondering if it seems like um, uh, what is it, the, the clock thing might have a, a, a use still, but do you ever see there's like a resurgence of doing that kind of style? I don't, I don't know. I mean, I. I uh, it was it was such a cheap thing for you know for us to express ourselves. I don't know how, how to put it any better than that. And you know what what you could reproduce, I suppose, would be 
the crummy little shadows. Where you, <laughs> get, you didn't get the corner of a galley mm -hmm. down properly, and then and then that would be missed by the printer. It wouldn't be retouched until you get the shadows on it. I'm trying to think. What what else can? What what else would was was on that? Time? Oh God! But I I would not want to go back to those days. I mean. But, uh, yeah. The letter set and letter tone and all that stuff oh, yeah. you used to. It was just so bloody labor intensive. Oh, yeah. yeah. But it's interesting because you, you want to sort of, if you want to do that style, maybe in like 20 years when no one has done it, it'll be like, oh, that's an interesting look. But I don't think yeah. the end result is going to be worth it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, that, that was the thing with letter set, though, is, you know, the term kerning, when you when you, you push a couple of letters together. So the classic would be a, um, a capital B and a capital A. Right? You, you, you push them together, whereas if they were just set, uh, you'd have this huge gap down the middle. Well, with letter set, you could just kern that beautifully. You could just get that precisely the way you wanted it. And of course, on a computer, you could do that with just a click, or maybe maybe AI will do it for you when it really set it. So, you know. But yeah, interesting. Anybody, anybody else? I think I think one of the things about this that, that I, I kept coming back to was this um, accessible, cheap technology that really worked for us at that time. That we were, and we were just like one step away from the mimeograph machine in the hand, or I guess you know the Bundes with the printing press and, and uh, that, that sort of thing. Um, I think that's one thing that really sticks with me. But then also, I guess, an element of it would be, um, for better or for worse, how self-taught we were. Uh, uh, and, you know, even people who are now coming in, uh, you know, I suppose people would go and they would take a, you know, a week-long course in InDesign and they would really know how to use uh, computer technology. But you can kind of stumble into the computer stuff, but you could stumble into the offset stuff, too. But I can't imagine anybody stumbling in the letterpress. Was a, a much more, I think, rigorous uh, thing, besides the fact that you're reading everything backwards. <laughs> yeah. So you do the entire layout yourself? Yeah, and, and then, then... Right to press, right? Well, yeah, well, then then, then what do we do is it, it, it's handed off to, uh, uh, to uh, a man named Denny Hunter uh, in Montreal, you know, hands it off. You know, nowadays, and uh, and he sort of fusses with it and fiddles with it, and he says, oh, "This didn't particularly work," and shifts them around a little bit, and and uh, and so it's it's a collaborative effort, but um, it's it's more like writing the thing to fit, which is you know, something an advantage I guess that I have because I really started off as a writer, and um, and you know I, I recognize that there are not that many people who will write and illustrate. I've had um, I've had a lot of uh, very very um, supportive and sympathetic publishers over the years who have largely met me do my work and do so that's done that. Great. And just as a segue to that, I just want to introduce Louis Peel again, my my publisher Midtown Press at the back, and uh, <laughs> who is the right. long my long suffering publisher. <laughs> 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 Michael, I want to try to test your memory because mine's kind of getting away. College printers, was it located around Arquivas and Broadway? 12th and Maple. 12th and Maple. That was fun. Okay. <laughs> 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 Sorry. About 12th and Maple, Northwest Corner. And there was another printer in uh, around 1st or 2nd, east of Berard. Oh, agency. No, not, not agency. Um, yeah, in a big, in a big building. In a big building. So, yeah, they had big, big lots of presses. It'll come to me. Where was it? But um, it was on First Avenue, east of Berard. Uh, so, Mitchell Press. Mitchell Press. Mitchell Press. Yeah, Mitchell Press. And they were a book publisher. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they did. They had a lot of stuff. So uh, I was called into Mitchell Press uh, when they were closing. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what it was we were getting from them to the library. Uh, I've also got a tale to tell about, uh, about the other press, all the printers. I had a buddy who worked there as a linotype guy. Oh, 
and he went to UBC during the day and at night he typed out the Georgia Strait. Okay, so the Georgia Strait, yeah, and I heard that the Georgia Strait was done linotype, or some of it, some of it. So, and a linotype machine was really a weird thing. You, you typed into a keyboard. Yeah. When a line was formed, it kind of went on an elevator up to the top. Yeah. <laughs> and somebody who understands these machines better than me will tell you what happened after <laughs> the elevator <ride. laughs> yeah. Yeah. But basically, it was composed into a page, I think. Age was yeah, and, uh, and uh, the metal the metal was poured into the form, and there was hot lead. Yeah, hot lead <laughs> it was part of the process. So yeah. my buddy had to drink two or three glasses of milk every day to get the lead out of the system. Oh, oh wow! wow. Okay. Yeah. The uh, the uh, the lead the molten lead would occasionally burp. Um, it's a term I've heard. There's a wonderful YouTube video called Vinyl Type and. Maybe uh, I'll, I'll give Natalie the URL and then we'll show up. And uh, yeah. loud, <laughs> dangerous, <laughs> I mean, just uh, clanked and uh, mm -hmm. rear Rube Goldberg uh, things going on right, left, and center. Uh, quite wonderful. Yeah, and it made a wonderful clattering sound as it kind of out its business. It was yeah. quite amazing. Yeah. I'm sorry I'm asking so many questions, but would it be a one shot for that linotype so it would get solidified into a large? Uh, plate and then it would be printed. Well, yeah. I get to the point of the line of type. Yeah. And the elevator, and beyond and then, that, you better. It's just magic. Okay. On the line of type machine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all that, all that text would then just be melted down. Oh, okay. And reused. Wow. And uh, you know, I'm sure eventually you had to throw some red pencils in there or something to top it up. <laughs> yeah, I know. It just, it just seems, it just seems like something sort of. Crazy archaic, and yet, you know, and besides just um, all of these moving things that could hurt you. And, and there was always a feeling that, you know, one had the printing presses, so don't get your fingers too close. Later, later, all that type had to be distributed, which is yeah. put back in the case, uh, generally a small voice with nimble fingers. Um, <laughs> Uh, the uh, YouTube video on online will type, I mean, it just molten and solidified the lead all over everything that had to be attacked with files and, uh, and cleaned up periodically. Uh, yeah. Lots and lots of uh, labor uh, after the fact. Uh, get it ready for the next one. So did you save the little card that you printed in front of school? The big project was the yearbook. Yeah, you did your yearbooks and the Anybody else? Glenn, the way, the way things changed, like you were talking about, I didn't know what probably was points for it, too. I, uh, within the last year, I took a, a little book I've been working on into a commercial printer in Vancouver, and I gave a mock up on a page there to this one I want, and all the measurements were in by using points. Because that's what Troy was working with at that time, and then he said, "What are these measurements? <laughs> and, uh, we, we we don't know what these are. Now we can't we can't do this." So I translated into inches for him. Uh, um, so it was, it was funny that if you took, if they hadn't heard of this. this I think most, people, most people still remember points for type size. If you say to somebody, "Well, yeah. that's ten point type," mm -hmm. then people would have an idea of it, mm -hmm. but. Um, but yeah, the pikas and the uh, and, and we'll certainly be at the lines and shit. But if you say seven comma six or something, they wouldn't have a clue what you're talking about. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So a vanished a vanished craft, I guess you would say. And, and, and thanks, Kellen, for the for the discussion that triggered me doing all this and, uh, and the silly little drawings. And it, because it was fun trying to remember. Because I don't, you know, I, I started off on this. And I mean, what did we do at this stage? And, what did that look like? And then when I couldn't find the images, as I said, I ended up uh, drawing, drawing them things and trying to figure out what it was that we actually used to do. And the fact that that's within you know, the last 50 years, after we began to disappear 40 years ago, and then, and yet, what comes a book printed on the offshore press? So, just the free press is gone. So thank you all very much for coming. And, and uh, it's just thank you, Michael. A real pleasure to do something 
not on Zoom, but we <laughs> 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 it's wonderful, and I hope it was good for you too. Yeah, thanks very much. Thank you.